Righto, so yeah, thanks for coming along. Um, today we continue on our BIM Basics sort of series and we're going to look at computer modeling um, on its own, so yeah, 3D modeling. So we're going to take a look at today what the purpose of the model is, um, what requirements, hardware and software, and just some basic modeling techniques to keep in mind as we work through our projects. So these things are what sort of influences how we uh, model and, and uh, um, successful model and how it's going to be used. First of all is the purpose of the model. Uh, secondly is how complex that model will be or needs to be. Uh, the third one is the size. So you know, obviously we've got projects in here which range from little files to massive files which then result in you know, needing to split files up so that we can make them workable. And then the last one is the hardware. So um, whether we've got hardware that's up to doing the job, something grunty like a PC. <laughs> so with the purpose of the model, so there's, there's lots of different reasons why we will um, model and, and how that model will be used. Um, Last week. Um, oh, hold on, what's that? It's on, okay. Seems to be going. So. It does that oh, does it? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's not so bad. Um, and then another purpose is for site planning. So if we just want to work out a way of, you know, or work out how our buildings are going to sit on the Sure, you told me that. Construction coordination, so it's where we get to the next level where they take our model and uh, use it for um, managing processes on site for developing uh, we call it prefabricated elements off site things like that and structural design so basically engineers taking our model and um, working with it to uh, design the systems that are going to hold it all up so um, we can start with <laughs> Is that coming from where the TV or or software? I wonder. It's bizarre. Um, <laughs> so we can take these three D surveys, digital surveys, laser surveys, and put them into a model and use them as a starting point from which to. Uh, build our our buildings and then we can also use those um, as a tool during the process or the building process to, to make sure that what is being built is what we've designed and everything's in the right place um, and then also after the fact as an as built so you know we can see that it has been built to plan and that there are no discrepancies so which is all comes back to to why it's essential to model correctly and accurately right from the start. Um, yeah, lost the... So conceptual model. So this is the model that we use for you know making those basic early design decisions, consulting the client on the size, the look, um, 
uh, we've got location, all those sorts of things. So the accuracy and the level of detail is not not overly important as long as we've got something that um, looks, you know, conveys the message of what we're trying to get across to the client before we move on on to the next stage. So things like materials, you know, they don't even have to be there. It's just just something to give the client a feel for what we're designing. The next level of, of modeling is the model for visualization. So this is where we want to take it and then produce photo renderings. Um, so we start to make uh, the level of detail a wee bit more accurate or, or, or look accurate, especially for the exterior or for the areas that we're going to um, render. Uh, we start introducing uh, textures and lighting, um, things like that. So this is where basically um, just concentrate on focusing on on the area that um, bin modeling. So this is where we then start taking the information and plugging into the model, we start accurate, start modeling more accurately. So we, we're gonna be using slabs and walls and roofs, um, you know, putting in windows, doors, adding furniture, and adding information into that, um, into those elements. So we know, you know, whether they're structural or load bearing, whether they're not, um, all sorts of other data that we want to used during the process and again that should only be kept to the level of detail that we need to um, detail to so some projects might only need a basic level of detail whereas others might want to be taken through to you know, um, construction and scheduling phases or even be used for facility management later on so then we've got to actually start putting in lots more detail So now we sort of start to using real building materials in our in our model. So it's really important to keep in mind when you are modeling that you are not just drawing some plans for someone to look at and build off, that you are actually building a building in 3D just in a computer. So junctions and um, heights and stuff you know keep that all in mind and that's why it's important too to regularly work in 3d rather than always working in 2d um, because you can then go through and quickly adjust things that are out of line or you know not high enough has this um, has these uh, material properties, priority things, which allow you to, um, or allow us to set material priorities so that those priorities, when we have like a, a slab and a wall joining, sitting on top of each other, it now, instead of just, you know, carrying the wall through and cutting the, um, oh, sorry, carrying the slab through and cutting the wall off, it now works out where the insulation should go and the cladding should go and so it creates a, a nice clean detail which then we can use in our 2D drawings later on because we've taken the minute amount of extra time to take care of our clean clean junctions that then it transfers through to all our details which are then drawn for us or created for us nicely and tidily and we don't have to do too much tidying up. So then when we get to the construction coordination models where we start needing to know things like uh, costs and time, um, so we're plugging that data into our model. We probably haven't done so much of that here yet, 
Um, I'm not sure whether we will sort of have the need for it in the, in the near future anyway, but uh, this is stuff where uh, we need to know what stage of the building something comes in, for instance, so that then the um, constructor can find everything that's coming in in six months' time or four months' time or whatever, and also the costing so that they can then build up accurate um, costings based on the model rather than doing too much manual uh, uh, calculation. And also this, this stage of the model is we can use for identifying a conflict and collision. So we use throwing into Celebri and coordinating it with um, all the other uh, consultants' files and looking for those problems where the pipes run through beams and stuff like that. So here's our virtual construction model. So we've basically, you know, modeled up a column, but in a BIM model, it's more than just a column that's got nothing in it. It has, it's built up of um, sort of a, a recipe of sorts to make it a, um, a usable element. So in this instance here, this column's got some concrete core, it's got steel reinforcing, um, and if we go to that level two of boxing, or what do you call it, um, formwork here, and then the, the facing material over the top. So they're all different components to that, that one, one column, um, which in a proper BIM model, we would have you know, the details of it. We'd be able to pull all that out of the, the BIM model. So then that all goes to the... Um, resources that are required on site. So you know, we've got the formwork there, the, the guys putting it in place. So, you know, obviously as our models get more complex, there's, um, or sorry, as our designs get more complex, our models get more complex as well. So ranging from, you know, a simple Wikibuzier modern Villa Savoy up to Franco Gehry's nightmarish um, design works over there. So how do we model some of these buildings? Um, you need to think about this before we start and, and fire into the, um, the the process too far. So we need to sort of try and keep things simple as possible, not, not design-wise but modeling-wise. So it's, it's no use creating some complex process to model something that can be done you know, relatively simply and the beauty of Archicad is that it does a lot of stuff for us really, really simply and you don't need a lot of complex um, workaround processes like some other software I've seen. Um, when a building does get too complex then we need to look at you know splitting files off, um, maybe splitting stages of the process off. So we've discussed it a lot lately with um, things like on a caveat, stuff like that, where, you know, putting those outside of the file or into their own file where they hot link back to the main file and doing all that sort of work so that it at least frees up the main model to be uh, more responsive for those in there. And then obviously using the appropriate tool. So sometimes, you know, it's not the only tool, so there are other tools that we can use to combine models and check models. So Celebri is really good at combining IFCs, stuff like that. Um, SketchUp even for massing and stuff, simple concept design work. So um, Grasshopper for Rhino for you know doing sort of the algorithmic design or, or design options and exploring different things. So there's lots of tools that have their place and uh, it's good to know what they do and how they can use some of them find someone who can use them to do something that you want to do. So the model size, and as we've noticed in a, a number of projects, this can um, get rather big at times. So there's a number of elements that, or a number of uh, reasons that, that that's going to happen. So one of them is just the sheer number of building elements. Someone told me that is it silt has got like a million Objects or something in it. I think Yanni said so. Or getting close to a million. Close to 
Yeah. yeah, so it's lots and lots of um, building elements. Um, another one is the, the polygons. So when programs like ArchiCAD render a, uh, a complex surface, it creates lots of polygons to break the surface down into manageable uh, things that can't sort of can't sort of model uh, you know, proper curved surfaces. The size of the project, so you know, obviously something like uh, Silta or Laxo with its you know 140,000 square meters is a, a big project. Uh, lack of teamwork was well, obvious. Uh, inappropriate computer hardware. So I have noticed that some people have been working on computers with not enough memory to then handle the processing of the file, so they end up not being able to do much and cause all sorts of problems. So pretty good to make sure that if you're going to be working on a big file, a big project, that you know the computer is actually up to it. And that can be a lot of reasons for the um, delays and problems as well. I've noticed that you know if your computer's not got the memory, it's, it's going to struggle. And inappropriate software usage. Um, one of the things that we've noticed there too is leaving files sitting open overnight, stuff like that tends to bloat the main file, which then slows everyone down. So it's always good just to close your ArchiCAD overnight rather than leaving the file sitting there waiting for you in the morning. Because it seems to be that what happens is the, the main file or the main saving point for the file is talking to all the computers that are processing and so it's it's having to keep a lot of stuff in reserve while people are on their on their own uh, version of the file and until they all close down it's still creating these packages of information that it needs to keep in mind to spread to the other guys when it opens so we found that if everyone closes down it tends to clean the file up and then everyone opens up and go through the process again rather than just adding and adding and adding to the file size. Is it beyond if you're taking uh, like a, uh, work without uh, You mean work offline? Yes. If you work offline. I haven't checked that. Because Marcus said that he does that. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that could be another one. Okay. Yeah. It works better than just leaving the file open and then closing Oh, yeah. Well, that's another one. I hadn't I actually had looked into that one. So, um, just logging off, going offline, working offline. So, you've done a send and receive beforehand. Yeah. Go offline and then come back online. Yeah. Yeah, and then send and receive. The only, the only problem, or the only other problem with that is that because we've got a lot of people working around and about and in different places, that uh, if you've left your computer logged in, so basically you're taking up an ARCHICAD license and a, a BIM Cloud license, although if, you're locked, if you've gone offline, you've probably freed up the BIM Cloud license. But just if you happen to end up being sick the next day, uh, your computer's sitting there with a... Um, a license locked up which someone's not getting access to so by closing down it does give everyone a chance to make sure that licenses are, are not being unnecessarily tied up and unavailable for people who actually need them mm -hmm. <laughs> for some reason it's a lot of obvious and to get corrupt that's a good reason to completely shut down and eventually delete off the I think though the more times, the more frequently you just close down overnight, the less of that sort of problem you have. I tend to do that every day. I don't tend to have a lot of problems with my files. So. so how can we effectively work with big buildings? So uh, probably one of the key is reducing the number of 3D polygons. So that's making sure our um, objects are not too complex. So, and we have been discussing the idea of uh, having basic objects for 
like the most of the design phase that sort of represent what we want them to represent, but are not necessarily exactly the same visually as the the real thing, and only bringing in the the visual stuff for um, yeah, 3D rendering and stuff like that. So it's a way of because you can still assign all the same parameters because it doesn't really matter in the end of the day what you put there. You put a box somewhere. It's not it's not so much the the actual box that we're worried about is what data that we've put into that box is. So in a box, you could just still assign, um, you know, the brand of chair, the color, the size, the model, the cost, the manufacturer, availability, you know, where it comes from. You could anything. So um, it's just keeping in mind, again, what you need the model for and how best to do it. So, if, if we had a client who wasn't so needy of, you know, one of caveats that show all the furniture in place, we don't need to probably put the real stuff there. Um, another thing is just turning off invisible elements in the layers that you're not using. So, um, you know, if you are doing uh, floor covering, say, you don't need furniture showing. You don't need um, you know, imported IFCs generally showing. So it's a case of working out what's really important to you and stripping your layer combination back to to that, so that you can then have a quick response time when you move through your model. Um, obviously, dividing the project. So that's something we do on a, on a on a larger level rather than just individually, and obviously having the appropriate hardware. So obviously having a good computer or, or the right computer helps. Um, enough memory, hard disk space, although saving to a server, we probably don't need as much hard disk space. And the graphics card's always critical. Uh, and sometimes too, that's a cause of problems. If you have a computer without a suitable graphics card, um, it can lock up and shut down and bug crashes and all those sorts of things and make uh, rendering and stuff like that difficult. So it's always something to keep in mind, especially when it's not so much a, a case for the work computers, but if you're working on another computer, or your own or something, or outsider's computer, yeah. So this is a typical classic building approach for, or BIM modeling approach for a small scale project. So we've got our BIM model, and out of that we get our visualization one way and our documentation. On more complex projects, we've got to bring in uh, a wee bit more uh, software. So we, you know, we've got our BIM application there. Then we've got things outside like a conception model. So there are things like SketchUp, um, any of those other, you know, model uh, modeling systems that you're likely to use. Um, free from modelers. So he's probably starting to bring in stuff like your Grasshopper and Rhino add-ons and taking out of the BIM application into like your rendering stuff. So then we've got things like uh, render lights and uh, Enscape and Twin Motion. Does everyone realize that Twin Motion is actually free at the moment? So if you are interested in a, a pretty good visualization software to have on your desktop as a, a go-to, um, Twin Motion is free to November, fully working um, full version. Well, that's pretty quick. I've been I've been playing with it at home, and it's um like it's it's producing really good renders in minutes. Yeah, but if you make those three tools, tools, oh, yeah, usually one point five gigabytes or something like that. Yeah, when you're getting saturated today. Yeah, more. Well, I think more because we tend to more for like this the basic rendering stuff, just you know, creating a picture. Because as we know, ArchiCAD takes so long. Um, it's always good to have something that you can jump into and you know create some renders and have a look. And it does produces um, really good renderings. And I don't I think you just go to twinmotion.com. If it's not if it's not there, 
it's unreal unreal.com because unreal have bought twin motion off yeah, actually it's funny that, that actually the engine is unreal yeah <laughs> so they bought their own product <laughs> so some computer modeling techniques so this is general um polygonal polygonal modeling which you know archicad is based on so it as I said, it takes your shape, like in this case, a sphere, and it breaks it down into lots of little wee polygons. Um, you'll notice a lot of objects can have a, uh, an option for a low res or a high res um, display. So if um, if the object itself or the or the three D representation of that object itself is not important, you just need it there for you know seeing it in the plan and getting the data out of it, or well then using the low resolution resolution model is um, a good option because it then decreases the whole amount of uh, file size. So then use your higher resolution models in the areas where you, you know, you're going to look at them more when, you go in, when you're ready to um, do some 3D visualizations. And then you've got this NURBS sort of stuff, which is uh, more and more or coming into ARCHICAD now. It is, is a system of moving these little uh, NURBS points and giving you more, more freedom to create those um, freeform spaces, which we're probably never likely to use here in Finland. Um, so we'll go past that. And then solid constructive solid geometry. So this is like our solid element operations where you're taking, you know, one sort of shape and using another shape to create subtractions or, or additions to it, um, which is really, really handy for all those um, furniture and creating recesses and all sorts of um, applications in ARCHICAD. I find that probably yeah, been one of my go-to tools for the last few years since it came in. So yeah, that's um, introduction to computer, the, well, the, the, the computer modeling side of things. And again, I can't stress enough how important it is to actually model accurately right from the start um, so that everything flows on it, but it's, it's no use creating a model and throwing some stuff down and then having to go through later on and make it all right, so you know, adjusting heights and widths and thicknesses. If you know if you know what something's gonna do, put it down and make it right. It takes no longer to do it right than to do it wrong. It just takes longer to do it when you do it wrong because then you've got to fix it up. So yeah, getting that model right and then we can do so much more with it and so much more, so much quicker. So thank you very much.